Cool stuff. How's it going, everyone? Uh, my name is Aaron Rosen. Um, I had a few people who helped me out uh, setting up this lab, uh, Eric Lopez and uh, Janet Yu. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to build a multi-tier application on top of OpenStack. Um, and we're going to be using Neutron with all the open source components. And we have that uh, deployed for you guys today. And we're going to allow you guys to uh, get access to a lab environment that's running on our NSX cloud and VMware. And on top of that, we have all the, these OpenStack components. So the way that you access the lab is if you go to this URL right here at the bottom of the screen, um, that'll take you to, I'll uh, leave it there for a sec. That'll take you to uh, this web page. I'll put it back in a second. And then this uh, top link here, it says go to this uh, URL to get access to the lab. If you paste that in here and fill this information out, this lab access code is, uh, it's right here. It's uh, OpenStack Atlanta 14. And uh, when you hit submit, it'll give you a IP address. Um, and a password uh, to access the lab. And there are two different ways to access the lab. Uh, the first way is to SSH directly into the instance um, using the IP address and password. And the second way is if you put it in your browser, um, there's a no VNC uh, console that runs uh, for it. So for instance, uh, in mine, You have to put a HTTPS uh, before it. It'll prompt you for the password. Um, I don't know, I have to look up what the password is that I'm using. And then it'll uh, allow you to use the no VNC uh, desktop as well if you don't have an SSH client. So uh, during the lab, if uh, anyone has any questions? Um, I have uh, two helpers here that should be able to help you guys out. If you just raise your hand, uh, we can uh, come over and uh, help you guys out. So, does any is anyone confused or stuck at this point on how to get access to the lab? I didn't fully follow the whole access code. Cool. So, there's this input box <coughs> that uh, asks you for an access code. And the access code is on that code pad uh, thing, uh, OSSS uh, Atlanta 14, I think, is what it is. Oh, right there. I see it. There it is. OK. Got it. Thank you. You take your uh, lane here. Uh, the SSH user is Nasira. Cool. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. So, N I C I R A. So I'll leave it right here for a second so you guys can see that. All lowercase. The password is when you hit submit, it should be displayed to you um, on the next prompt. Uh, the password randomly generated. Yeah, it'll give it to you in email, but it should also be on the page when you hit submit. Do you want to check? Yeah, so if you want to use, um, so there are two ways to access the lab. The first way is you could just SSH directly into the instance if you have a SSH client, or you could use your browser, and you have to put HTTPS um, first, and then put the IP address, and then it'll prompt you for the password, paste it in. What user are we supposed to be? The username to SSH into is Nasira, N-I-C-I-R-A. Right now, it's all kind of just 
Weird. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's doing that. I'll reset it. That's fine. What's up? The username is Nasera. Yeah, the username is Nasera. So if you're going to SSH into it, you would just do something like that. SSH. Right, yeah, it's only command line, so you don't need the GUI. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I would just use like the SSA, it's just using a shell if you have it. Sure, it's right here at the bottom of the screen. Oh. Oh. Cool. Is everyone like able to SSH in? All right. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of an overview of what we're going to try and do in this uh, lab. So we're going to go ahead and uh, deploy a multi-tier application on top of OpenStack. So what this is going to consist of is we're going to leverage uh, security groups in order to control which things are able to communicate with each other. So in the application that we're going to deploy, we're going to have two web servers, and we're going to use a security group on those to only allow uh, uh, TCP port 80 into them, so only allow HTTP traffic. We also have this uh, jump host, and what we're going to use this host for is um, in order to get into your web servers, this host is going to have a public IP address, so you're going to be able to SSH into the jump host, and from that host you're going to be able to SSH into the web servers. So this allows us to uh, prevent having to put the web servers directly on the WAN, and uh, then we're going to create a load balancer, and uh, create a, a pool of nodes and put the web servers in that, so the load balancer will uh, balance the requests across the servers. Um, after we're done with that, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, use the firewall as a service stuff just to show how you can uh, uh, use firewall rules on the router in order to have a little bit more enforcement uh, besides having enforcement on the nodes directly. Um, so this is the lab topology that we have deployed. Um, in a little bit, I'll show you what it looks like under the hood um, running on top of NSX, but this is just a high-level overview. So there are two compute nodes, um, and the compute nodes are actually in different subnets, and the instances are, are able to have uh, L2 connections between each other because we have, we're using uh, overlays, which allows us to not worry about what the physical network looks like. So even though the, they don't have real, IP or real L2 connectivity, um, with the overlays, we're, allow we're able to uh, simulate that. Um, on the compute nodes, there are uh, two pieces of software running. There's an L2 agent that's responsible for programming OVS, the flows in it, and setting up the tunnels between the uh, nodes. And there's also Nova Compute, which is responsible for spinning up the KVM instances. There's also a network node. The network node sits on the WAN of the network. That has the DHCP agent, which is responsible for handing out IP addresses to the instance. This is the L2 agent in order to uh, connect all the L2 networks. The L3 agent, which is going to be used to do NATing and floating IPs. It also has the load balancer agent and the metadata agent. And there's also a third uh, instance that is running that has all the OpenStack API endpoints. Cool. Right, the L2 agent is the OVS agent. And in this, in your setup, you're actually using the ML2 plugin from, from IceHouse. Okay. And then you said there's no tunneling or there's a tunneling? There is tunneling. So the compute nodes are in two different um, subnets. So we're able to create instances on uh, each compute node and have L2 connectivity between them. And it's using a uh, GRE tunneling to accomplish that. Cool. So if, if you go to uh, that bit.ly link, 
Um, there are some instructions that are, uh, oops, that are laid out and uh, the steps that we're going to take. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to source this OpenRC file. And all this does is it, uh, put, it sets some environment variables in your, in your bash environment in order for, in order for you to be able to uh, issue commands. Uh, one sec. Do you know what the root password is for this? <laughs> Sorry about that, one sec. Oh, I know what the problem is. Cool. So uh, we're going to go ahead and source that uh, demo RC file. And if you look in that file, all it does is it sets some uh, bash variables up, in, which uh, <coughs> contains the credentials of the, the user and also has the API endpoint. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and uh, create a network. So what this does is this just creates a uh, L2 broadcast uh, zone. So that just creates basically a L2 segment, like a switch. And after doing that, we're going to create a subnet. So basically what that does is it adds um, L3 onto the network. So whenever you create ports on the network, it's going to go ahead and allocate IP addresses for you. And there's also a DHCP agent that's going to um, assign these IP addresses uh, when instances get created on the network. OK, so when you SSH into the machine, uh, you come in through the VMware interconnect uh, onto this jump host uh, that uh, I think, I'm not sure which box you're actually on, but it's on a, I think it's actually on the API controller node. Um, you come onto this box here. But once you source the file. It's a separate VM. Yeah, it's a separate VM. Oh, so it's actually a separate VM, yeah, that you source the file that has uh, connectivity to all of these networks as well. So. After you create the network, after you do neutron net create uh, private net that creates uh, uh, the L2 broadcast zone, then we're going to attach a subnet to it. So I'm going to go ahead and follow along and, and do the same things. Cool. So the next step is we're going to go ahead and create a router. <coughs> And after we create a router, we're going to uh, uplink this router to the public uh, network. So if, if you, so this basically allows uh, things attached to the router to go in and out to the internet. And uh, we've already gone through and uh, created this public network for you, because this is a step that the, admin, the cloud administrator would need to do, uh, because we need to tell OpenStack the public IP or just ranges that are attached to the LAN. So, to, so the first step is we're going to do neutron uh, router create. 
And then we're going to do neutron router gateway set to attach it to a network called public. So um, right now, if I do neutron netlist, um, you'll see that I have two networks. I have a uh, public network that, that was already created uh, for you, and then a private network, which we just created. So I just created a uh, router. Now I'm going to go ahead and uplink the router to the public uh, network. So the next step after doing that is we need to uplink this uh, network that we created to the router as well. So this will allow uh, ports that are created on this network to be able to flow to the router and then to the public internet. And by default, when you create um, routers, they are uh, NATed. So you're not going to have a public IP address. So you won't be able to come in from the internet into your instance unless you associate a floating IP address. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as well. Cool, so the next step is we're going to go ahead and create a security group. And what a security group is, is it's basically just a container of rules. So we're going to create a security group uh, called jump host, which we're going to use to assign uh, to this one host. And inside the security group, we're going to create a, we're going to have a rule that allows uh, TCP port 22 into it. So this will allow traffic um, for directed towards SSH to go into the instance. Yeah, jump host is just a random name. Yeah, jump host is just a random name that I chose. I would probably use the same name here just to make it easier because it refers to jump host all over. Can you make a font Excuse me? A uh, font? Sure. Right, so the previous command, so previously we had a router, and then we uplinked the router to the public network. And then after that, we uplinked the network that we had created called private to the router. So these are all the steps. We create a router, we, uh, we do uh, so you Neutron. Don't have to really which router interface you use. Right, so you, you could specify like the IP address that you want um, on the private side to attach. But by default, it takes the dot one. But if you wanted to use like any other IP address, you could specify that when you attach the network to the router. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> so on this side, this guy is going to have an IP address of 10.0.0.1. And on this side, this guy is going to have an IP address out of the public IP pool um, that isn't exposed to you as a tenant, because this is going to be a NATed IP address. Yeah, by default, if you don't specify it, it's going to be dot one. But you could specify it if you wanted to. Um, does it check if dots one is in use? Uh, it probably does. It, it might not. There could potentially be like a corner case or a bug around there. But actually, uh, we can check. Yeah, so the way it works is the IP allocation pool uh, starts at uh, dot two and ends at uh, dot two five four, so one less than the broadcast address. So it ensures that it's outside of that allocation range. Thank you. Cool, so we've just created this uh, security group called uh, Jump Host. Now we're going to put a couple rules in here. We're going to allow ICMP traffic and then TCP port 22. I'm just allowing ICMP traffic just like, uh, just so it's easy to ping and like help debug things to see that things are kind of working. So this uh, allows us ICMP ingress uh, to the instance. And then this is going to allow TCP port 22 uh, into uh, the jump host security profile. So the next step that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and boot a VM. 
And uh, we specify the image that we're going to use, and we're just using this uh, Cirrus image that's just a really small uh, VM form factor. We're specifying, a, we want a flavor of one, and that's basically the size of the VM. And uh, we're specifying the security groups that we want to attach to the instance. So in order to figure out that um, the images that are available, uh, you could do Nova image list. And that shows you there's a Cirrus image and this other image, two images here. And if you do a Nova flavor list, that'll sh uh, explain to you a little bit about the flavors that we're selecting. So we're just using flavor one because we want to boot a small instance that's going to have uh, one disk, one CPU, and 250, uh, uh, 512 megs of RAM. Uh, excuse me. So the things that we're doing here uh, with command lines are exactly could be done from the, the horizon. Right. Correct. These exact same steps you could do through the horizon. Everything interface. could be done through yep. the horizon today. The horizon interface can like hide a little bit of the complexities of doing this. Like when you create an instance, you, uh, I mean, it just shows you like in right. a UI form factor, so it's so potentially yeah, a little easier. Yeah, choose the flavors and everything, and yep. the security group that we want to attach. Yep. Those are all like check boxes in horizon in order uh, there. So I went ahead and booted the instance. So the next thing you can do is if you do Nova list, this shows the state of the instance. Um, so it's in spawning state right now. So if you keep doing Nova list, this will go ahead and uh, like refresh and see uh, what, what the instance is doing. Uh, so this is running uh, nested, nested in the cloud. So things are a little bit slow to like kick off. So it should come active within 30 seconds or so. When you add the interface to the public network, and then you add the interface, or you attach the router to the public network, and then you add the interface to your private subnet, how do you go in and list out that router to see which IPs that it, it grabbed when you when you created it? Sure. So uh, there's a Neutron, I think it's called router interface list. Uh, neutron router port list. So this shows uh, the router ports that are attached to it. So, sorry, what was your question? How do you know which ports are attached to the router? Yeah, just to see what the ports are. Cool. Yeah, so this uh, neutron router port list or, uh, shows the ports that are attached to the router. So you're able to uplink multiple subnets to uh, the router as well. We can do that after we walk through this if you, if you want to do that. And when we issue this command, you'll see that there are multiple networks uh, connected to the router, and this would show it to you. Is everyone to uh, about this step of booting the VM? Um, booting the jump host instance? Cool. So uh, at this point, hopefully this instance should be up. So it's uh, active. So th the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and associate a floating IP address with this instance. So this will allow us to uh, get into the instance. So right now, uh, if we ping this IP address, this is just an internal IP address that is behind the router. So we're not able to access it directly. So in order to do that, it needs to have a floating IP address so we can route into it. I'm still, I've been spawning for a long time. Anybody else Yeah, it should eventually, it should eventually work. So one of the reasons why the spawning is a little bit slower in Icehouse um, is one of the things that we do is we start the instance in pause state, and we wait for the network port to be wired. And as soon as it's wired, uh, the L2 agent will set the port status as active in Neutron, and then Neutron will send an event to Nova, and then Nova will unpause the instance. So this avoids a race condition of the instance coming up and the networking not being ready. Because some of the client scripts inside of the instances will try and DHCP, and the D some of the scripts only tried to DHCP twice and then give up after like 30 seconds or so. So uh, this helps us to avoid that type of race condition. This all happens automatically behind the scenes. If you had to do, we use the mic. Sorry. 
You said you are posting it uh, until all the uh, VMs come up, right? So uh, how do we do that? I know you are, you are done it. So can you share that trick? One, one more time. So, sorry, I didn't. You, you said you pause because the, if everybody asks for oh, the DHCP. Okay. Sure. So what I was saying is the instance is started in pause state um, automatically. So Nova will create the instance and start it in pause state with the tap interfaces wired to the bridge. Oh, how do you pause it? So this happens like these are internal de details, and like the compute node, it automatically does this. So it does this through libvirt. Um, it does it, it like starts the instance automatically for you in pause state. When the networking is ready for the instance, then Nova Compute will unpause the instance for you. Um, but you could pause the instance through an API call to do that. Uh, you could do Nova pause. Cool. So, is everyone's instance active, or are we still spawning? Is there a way to? Will you pass the mic back? Sorry. Is there a way to access Horizon? A horizon? Um, yes, you could access Horizon. HTTPS, so just the IP slash dashboard slash admin. Right. I believe if you uh, I tried it, it doesn't work. I think it's Eric. Do you know what the IP address for Horizon is inside of uh, the instance? Or it's just localhost. No, it should be. If you bring up Firefox, yeah. it automatically redirects you there. What? Oh, you mean within the VM itself, but not external. I can't. Oh no, you can't access Horizon externally. Oh. No, you have to access it through the instance. Got it. Yeah, that like port eighty isn't forwarded into the instance. But I would probably follow along with uh, this because you might get off on the workflow. Um, So spawning, okay. It should eventually uh, get active. <laughs> we'll give it another minute. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, c continue in doing the next steps because I have to boot two more instances and it'll probably take a while for those to come up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and associate a pro uh, floating IP with this instance. So in order to do that, I need to figure out the port ID that's attached to this instance. So one of, th one of the ways you can do that is you could do neutron port list to see the ports. So this displays all the ports that are available to my tenant. So this is the port ID that I need. Um, there's a, this dot one is the gateway address, and this dot three is uh, the DHCP agent that creates a port on the network in order to provide DHCP for you. Um, so, um, it, so as soon as there's a uh, a port created on the network that's uh, not a, uh, as soon as there's another port created on the network, then the DHCP agent creates a port, and it just does that just to save resources. But so now I'm going to associate a floating IP address to uh, this port here. Uh, no, you only care about the, the ID. So one thing you could do is you could do neutron port list dash CID. So this will go ahead and find the port that uh, you're looking for. If you do dash CID, that's just the ID. And you're going to pass that to neutron uh, uh, floating IP create dash dash port ID, that, and then public, which is the public network. But, okay, but that'll only work once? 
Yeah, that will only work once. No, I mean, it'll only work once our... Instance is active, right. So, uh, if it's still spawning... Yeah, if it's still in spawning state, you'll have to wait. So once that's done, I can do Nova list, and we'll see that that floating IP address is uh, displayed right here. And, uh, and we should be able to ping that and uh, SSH to it as well. Uh, dot two is the one uh, it grabbed. Uh, when you do uh, um, neutron floating IP create, it'll show you this output here. And it'll have the floating IP address. And uh, if you like cleared the screen out, you could also do neutron floating IP list. And this displays the internal IP, the floating IP, and the port ID that it's mapped up to. So, right, the port ID is the current corresponding to the dot two IP address. So you need to do something like uh, like this in order to get the ID that you need. Um, I'm not sure if you could pass in a name. So there is a name. You could pass in a name on the port if you wanted, and then <coughs> and then pass that in. Um, I'm not sure if the Python Neutron client supports that, but we could definitely extend it so that if there's a name there, it could do a search and then do it to simplify things for the user. Is everyone doing all right? Or, are we still out of spawning state, or some people still are still spawning? You're still spawning? Cool, what's it? Sure, so uh, what this demo is using is it's just using the reference implementation for load balancing, which just uses HAProxy. But there are also a number of vendors that have uh, driver mechanisms in the tree. I think, uh, um, yeah, Radware, F5, um, there are a few others. Uh, Will you repeat that one more time? When you would create the security group? Yeah, these are the drivers that are in the tree right now. Netscale, Redware, uh, HA Proxy, uh, and Brain. What's that? Uh, yeah, the, the VM has one IP address. Um, it has an internal private IP address, and then it also has a floating IP address, which is inserted into the router, which performs NAT. So this allows you to like move that IP address between multiple uh, VMs if you wanted to. But again, uh, the IP that other VMs see is... Yeah, the instance will only see this 10.0.0.2 IP address. So for example, now we can uh, SSH into this instance. Uh, the username is uh, Cirrus, and I think there's already a, uh, the key, okay, it's not. And the password is CubsWin, um, and it should be in this dock here somewhere. Right here. Cubs win with a smiley face. So, so once you get in the instance, if you do if config, you'll see that there's only uh, he only sees this internal IP address of 10.0.0.2. And we accessed it, and we got into him using the floating IP address. Right. So it works on that machine because. Uh, that's like up to the router, so it has a route into that. Right, so we could change the IP address, we could 
boot another VM and then move this floating IP address from one VM to another VM. So it's helpful if you want to deploy like an updated version of your software and when you want to switch, switch it over so traffic goes to the other place, you could just uh, reassociate the floating IP with a different port. And this, all, this is all informed on the, the, where's the service performed on a Neutron controller? Right, so you would make the API call to Neutron, and then in the back end, it would go ahead and make this happen. So we're using the ML2 implementation with the L3 agent. So what happens is when you make this API call, it puts a message on the RPC bus, and the L3 agent will then go ahead and like rechange the state of things in himself in order to reflect this change. So migrating from one IP to the other is instantaneous? Um, pretty close to instantaneous. Yeah, you shouldn't be able to ping the dot two IP um, because that's the internal IP. So you need to create the floating IP. Are you pinging the 172? Um, What's up? Uh, I'm on the desktop uh, only. Right, yeah, I'm trying to Cool, so are some people up to this step? Yes? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on just, cause, uh, just so we can get all the way through it and we can uh, retract back um, and catch people up when we get to the end of it. So as you can see, I SSH into that floating IP address which gets me into this instance that has uh, only one neck with the private IP address. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create another security group um, called web. And in this security group, uh, this security group is going to be mapped to our web servers. So we're going to go ahead and do this and create the group. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create two rules. This first rule here allows uh, TCP port 80 into the instance. And the second rule here um, has a self-referential rule. So what this does is it says it allows uh, TCP port 22 into it from members who are a member of the jump host. So this allows us to continuously add more web servers and they'll automatically be able to be accessed from members of the jump host group. So it allows us not to have to like make any manual configurations when we add more hosts. Excuse me, one, one question. Who exactly is aware of that uh, private IP address in the network? The VM has 10, sorry. The VM has 10.0.0.2 IP address, right? right? That's the IP address of the VM. So who exactly in network beside that VM knows about that IP. So that happens is inside router? of the router, yeah. The router has NAT rules that goes Correct. and makes that happen. But is that is that it? That's Yeah, that's it. Okay. So like when an IP address comes into the router, he, he says, oh, the destination IP is, is this floating IP address. So then it goes ahead and does a DNAT to send the destination to 10.0.0.2. So even if there are VMs on the same subnet, even for them, same, same thing, right? It has, still has to go through the router? So if VMs communicate on the same subnet, they'll go just go directly to them. Okay, it's just so they don't, they don't need that. Obviously, it won't go through that NAT function. Right, it won't, because it's just going to go directly to it. Just but like I think L2. in this case, you don't have any, just one VM. Yeah, this is just one VM separate, at this point. Separate subnet. So I, ca I can show you that once we launch the web servers. Okay. So that, what's that? Why does it only show one interface? Uh, because there is only one interface. Like when we launch the instance, 
So when we launch the instance, there's only one network available, so it only creates an interface on that network. So there's only one interface. The floating IP isn't actually an interface. It's just a NAT rule that goes ahead and translates that floating IP to the internal IP and the internal IP to the floating IP when it goes in and out. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and boot these uh, two web servers because this could potentially take a while. So if I do Nova list, we'll see that I have the jump host that's in active state. Here's its floating IP. And then we have uh, two more instances that are coming up, uh, web server one and web server two. Yeah, I would go ahead and spawn, spawn those as well. Did your instance ever go in active state? Or it, it did? Yeah, I, already, I just did those steps. So if you want to like, follow ahead, you can. If you just follow through that CodePad link and just follow the exact steps, um, you can go ahead of me if you want or catch up if you're, if you're behind. So we can see Web Server 2 is active, and he got a .5 IP address. And uh, Web Server 1 is still in spawning state. So how does Nova become aware of the, uh, the IP addressing and stuff? So the way that it happens is you, you're telling Nova to boot an instance. And if you don't pass in any networks, by default, it'll go ahead and create a port on the, first, on the network that it has. So there's only one network. So it'll go ahead and create a port on that network for you. Um, so, so but in this scenario, uh, Neutron just let it told. It's like, by the way, associate this. this so the way that it works is it gets to a compute node. The compute node goes ahead and talks to Neutron and creates a port in Neutron. Neutron returns an IP address to Nova, then an IP, like uh, the port information, and then Nova will then boot the uh, instance using the MAC address that uh, Neutron told it. And then the DHCP agent will go ahead and, uh, or the VM will come up, do a DHCP request. The DHCP agent knows the MAC. And Nova's using that Mac, and he'll get the IP. So despite the fact that the VM doesn't have an awareness, it's all being managed above it. Right. It's all being managed above. He just gets the IP through okay. DTP. So I actually have here my VM state money, but then I'm not able to track the ping Uh Which IP are you pinging? OK, the floating IP address? OK, so one, one thing that you can do in order to like help debug like why things aren't working um, is if you do Nova console log and then type in the, like say, the instance, so like jump post, uh, this will go ahead and display uh, what's going on in the instance, because the instance writes to a serial port, and uh, that data is there. So you can see like the instance, it, instance it booted up. He did a DHCP request, and here are the routes. And my jump host, he has this IP. Uh, the command is Nova console log. And then you pass in the host name. So it could be possible that the instance is still like booting and it hasn't gotten to the DHCP uh, state yet. So in my setup, uh, we've got the two web servers up. I'm just going to go ahead and keep uh, are people up to this point at all? Could I get a show of hands of people who are up to this point? OK. Looks like there are a good number of people, so I'm going to keep pushing on, and we can circle back. Um, so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to SSH into uh, these web servers, and we're just going to start up a little dummy web server. We're just going to use uh, netcat just to return back web server 1 and web server 2. So when someone does a get request against it, it's just going to return, return that. So. So uh, this step is a little bit tricky. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to jump into the, you'll have to SSH into the jump host. So you'll do SSH Seros at, and then the floating IP you have. So now we're inside of the, the jump host. Um, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to SSH in, into Web Server 1 and Web Server 2. So you can see Web Server 1 has an IP address of .4. Web Server 2 has an IP address of .5. So we'll do SSH 10.0.0.4. .0 .0 .4. 
Um, we'll type in the password again, Cubs win with a smiley face. And then we'll go ahead and uh, paste this line uh, right here. Oops. Cool, so after you do that, you'll type exit. And now you're back on the jump host again. Um, it's a little bit confusing because the terminal prompt doesn't pay put which host you're on. So once you're back on the jump host, now we're going to SSH the second uh, web server, web server 2. So, so if I scroll up here, web server 2 is 10.0.0.5. So if I SSH 10.0.0.5, enter the same password again, Cubs win the smiley face. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, use this second uh, command. I accidentally cut that uh, beginning of the paste. So now when I type exit, I'm back on the jump host. So at this point, I can use curl and curl to either of these uh, hosts, and it should return the host name. So if I do curl 10.0.0.4, say web server 1, 5, web server 2. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and deploy a load balancer um, and create a VIP, and it's going to load balance between these two when the VIP is accessed. You have a question? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do those steps. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a load balancer pool. So what this is responsible for is it's just kind of like the security group concept as well. It's just a container. Um, so we're going to create this container, and then we're going to add our, uh, our web servers to it as members. So if you do uh, Nova list again, this displays the IP addresses of the hosts. So we'll go ahead and do this, and we'll enter uh, the IP addresses uh, of Web Server One and Web Server Two. So 10.0.0.4 and uh, 10.0.0.5. So the next step is we need to create a health monitor. What the health monitor does is it's going to continuously probe uh, the members of the pool to check to see if they're still alive. So the load balancer allows us to have some kind of high allows us to provide high availability in a sort of way. So you can like add more nodes to it. If the nodes die, the load balancer will automatically take them out of the pool and won't serve traffic to them. So it allows things to crash and and have things keep running. Sure, so the way that it works is when you create this uh, health monitor right here, um, you can see the type of check that it's using. I believe you can do uh, ICMP as well to like ping it. Um, uh, but this is just going to do a GET request using HTTP um, against it uh, for three seconds, and it will allow three timeouts. So after nine seconds, it'll, if the host isn't responding to a GET request, it'll pull it out of the pool. So this way, um, when you go ahead and request against the VIP, um, you won't get like an error. It'll go to a host that's actually known to be alive. We're not going to use a floating IP for the web server bec because we want to create a load balancer, which is going to get a VIP. And then we're going to associate that VIP with a floating IP um, because we want to have some way to load balance between the web servers. So this way, you can access one IP address, and it'll automatically route you to one of the web servers. So this goes ahead and creates the health monitor. And after creating the health monitor, we need to associate that with uh, the pool that you created. So in order to do that, you need to copy the ID of the health monitor here and uh, issue this command. So right now, I have a load balancer that has two members uh, of it and then a health, um, a health check uh, that's associated with the pool. So the next step is I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a, a VIP. That, so basically, I'm going to tell it the protocol, so HTTP and port 80. And uh, it's going to go ahead and uh, create a port. And when the IP address on this port is accessed, it's going to automatically like round robin between 
between the members of the pool. And the way that that works is we uh, selected the, like the load balancer method was Ron Robin before, but you could pick a different algorithm uh, if you wanted to. So I'll go ahead and do this, and uh, you can see it returned this IP address 10.0.0.6. And it's the th same case before with internal IP addresses. I'm not able to like access that IP address from the outside world until I associate a public IP address with that. And one of the reasons for that is you could potentially have an application that wants to be load balancing internally and not actually be on the public internet if, there's, if you had an application that wanted to load balance. Um, like something else as well. Yeah, or a, data, a database, yeah, that's a good, good example. Cool, so uh, after doing that, if we want to allow this, uh, this VIP to be accessed on the public internet, we're going to need to associate a floating IP address with it. So in order to do that, we're going to do the same command that we did uh, before, neutron floating IP create, and we'll tell it the port ID. So you can see the port ID is already uh, here. So that'll go ahead and uh, return this to us. So when this IP address is accessed, uh, 172.161.131, it's going to go ahead and uh, convert that to 10.0.0.6 and forward that to uh, the load balancer. The load balancer is going to receive the request and then route it to one of the pool members. Right, so the question was if you're using a different uh, like vendor's driver, um, is it going to be different? So one of the big things that we uh, tried to do is we tried to have a generic API that all the vendors can come behind. So this way, if you're using one vendor's backend implementation, um, a client can go ahead and write code against the Neutron APIs, and it doesn't matter what vendor uh, is in the backend. So this allows it to be like very portable. So there are some cases where a company might have some special feature um, that isn't part of the API. And the way that we handle that is we have extensions to the API to allow uh, that vendor to expose that type of uh, functionality. Um. OK, so at this point, we have the floating IP associated with the VIP. So now what I should be able to do is I should be able to curl against this. And if everything's working right, it should return uh, web server 1 and then web server 2. So you can see it's automatically load balancing uh, for me. Um, so the next step that we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a firewall. And we're basically going to uh, so, yeah. so it's telling me that there's no servers available when I'm trying to take my um, <coughs> Cool. So at this point, the load balancer is uh, round robining uh, these requests. So we're going to go ahead and uh, create a firewall uh, to do enforcement at the router. So for example, we don't need to allow like, um, like other miscellaneous traffic to reach all the way to the VIP uh, if we don't want it to. So we can stop it at the router instead of allowing it to get all the way to the instance. Um, so the firewall uh, API stuff is still a little bit experimental. It's still missing uh, zonage, so it's kind of a... Uh, it kind of maps to a tenant. So when a tenant creates a firewall, it doesn't actually map to a router. It's kind of a global, a global thing right now. So one of the things that we would like to do is scope that to a location um, as well. But that isn't done yet. So right now, when you create a firewall, it's going to be mapped uh, globally to all your instances and all your networks that you own. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a uh, policy. And uh, this is just creating a default policy that we're going to add rules to. Um, after we create the policy, we're going to create a firewall and then map it to this default policy. So after you do that, you'll no longer be able to curl to these IP addresses um, because they're, uh, by default, the firewall uh, blocks all traffic. So we're going to go ahead and uh, create a rule to allow HTTP traffic, and we're going to go ahead and uh, insert it into the, the firewall policy.
So this creates a firewall rule that says if the protocol is TCP and the destination port is 80, um, allow access to it, or allow access, and we called this rule allow HTTP. So the next step is to go ahead and insert that into the firewall policy. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, insert this rule into the firewall policy, and after doing that, um, we should be able to curl against it and see things that are working. So one of the nice things that the load balancer allows you to do is say we one of the instances experiences a failure. So if I do a Nova list and uh, delete one of the web servers, say I delete web server one. The load balancer is going to be doing these health checks against it. So after it sees that web server one is no longer responding, it's going to go ahead and uh, stop sending traffic to it. So when I run this command, it's going to just return web server two because he's the only uh, pool member that it's active. So the instance has been deleted. So probably by now the health checks have timed out. So if I do this, you can see it's always returning uh, web server two. No, I, I typed, I hit backspace, so the IP was messed up. It doesn't load balance for you, right? Um, so did you SSH to both hosts, web server one, and then run that while loop and then web server two? Are you able to, uh, if, Okay, um, I would like SSH into the jump host and then check if you can curl to those individually first to like debug that. Oh, that works? Okay, so if you, um, so if you do a neutron LP member list, um, it should show what does it show here? So you can see that there are two members of the pool and this one's marked as inactive because I deleted the instance. Cool. Well, this kind of uh, concludes like the steps that, or what I was going to demo. But if there's anything you guys want to see, um, I can go ahead and like demonstrate it up here. If there's like additional things you're curious about. Can I show you the public network stuff? Oh, how the public network was created? Sure. So the way the public network was created is you needed to be an admin uh, user, and the way that it was created was something like. Neutron net create. Um, so that's the command that was run uh, before the cloud admin ran this, like as part of the installation. Uh, that basically says this network is a public network that's uh, mapped to the floating IPs, that's mapped to IP pool. Uh, no, there's uh, nothing addi additional that's really uh, special. The L3 agent is basically going to, I mean, pick, pick up messages when ports are created out of that. And uh, one thing I wanted to show you guys is, so we, d I, all of this is running on top of uh, NSX, which is the product that uh, VMware uh, develops for our network virtualiz virtualization solution. So Neutron is a pl pluggable framework. There's uh, multiple vendors that have plugins in the tree in order to implement like networking functionalities. So uh, for example, when you log into uh, NSX, this is, a, this is just a, inter a UI interface that makes API calls in order to uh, communicate with the controllers in order just to display information. So we have uh, controllers. So we, as you can see, we have uh, five controllers here running. And what the controllers do is they go ahead and program all the OVS nodes on all of the hypervisors. So you can see here, 
We have uh, 188 hypervisors re uh, registered. Those are machines that VMs are going to be booted on. We have uh, nine gateways. What the gateways are, those are nodes that allow, those are nodes that connect to the public internet with the floating IPs connect to. So in the open source implementation, the L3 agent is the gateway which is used. Um, but in, in our implementation, we have uh, these things called gateway services where you create a gateway service and then you put machines in it and then it provides high availability between, <coughs> uh, for your L3. So if one of the gateways dies, um, traffic will continue to flow and it'll file over the NAT tables for you. Can I give two floating IP addresses? Um, so you can't give two floating IP addresses to the same internal IP because it wouldn't know what to do uh, with that. Um, so as I was showing you before, uh, in the lab topology here, we have several networks that are created and a router uplinked uh, to it. So I went through here and I found uh, one of the networks uh, or one of the labs that were deployed. Um, this is just the tenant ID. And we can see here are all the networks that's uh, accessible, accessible for the tenant. Here's all the, the ports um, that are in the lab. So you can see everything's green. Uh, this one's down, but it's marked down on purpose uh, in order to uh, prevent like access into VMware infrastructure. Um, and here are uh, here are the ports that are attached to routers. So one of the cool things here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this uh, um, lab management network. So this is just this uh, management network here that all of the hosts are connected to. So you can see over here it said there are six ports on it, and then here there are, uh, there are six different uh, machines on that. Or there are five, but one of them is the DHCP port. Oh, sorry, one of them is the patch port up to uh, the router. Um, so this shows all of the ports that are on uh, that network. And uh, one of the things you can do is you can click on one of the ports here. And it'll go ahead and like show you additional information about it. Um, here's the MAC address that's on the port. Um, it's going to go ahead and look up the transport node. So this is on server 490. And uh, one of the things that can be challenging when you're debugging these virtual networks is when things aren't pinging, understanding where things are even in, in the data center. Um, since now, it, things can be anywhere. Like the L2 is able to span anywhere. So one of the tools that we provide is this uh, port connection tool. So if you find there's a connectivity problem, you can uh, select the ports here and click go. And what happens is the controller is going to insert uh, packets into uh, the data plane in order to figure out where things aren't flowing and what the problem is. So I went ahead and did that. And it's going to go ahead and show what the topology looks like. Uh, there's one thing that I forgot to mention is uh, this service node concept. So what the service nodes do is the service nodes are kind of an offloading mechanism for broadcast. So if you have a VM that's doing a ton of broadcasting, um, the hypervisor has to uh, uh, duplicate, those port, duplicate those packets across all of the ports. So that can be kind of CPU intensive. So in order so that the instance doesn't feel any of that pain because the hypervisor is doing all that duplication, it goes ahead and sends the packets to one of the service nodes. And the service node's jobs are just for uh, like doing replica packet replication for you. So those guys go ahead and duplicate the packets for you so that the instance doesn't uh, experience any kind of effect if there's a, a VM on it just doing a ton of broadcasting. So it kind of acts like multicast a little bit? Yeah, so that, that's uh, where multicast traffic would, would go as well. If someone's using multicast, it would traverse through the service node. Um, you could also have the hypervisors um, do the replication for you, but if you add the service nodes, it just provides a way to offload that. So in this case, uh, we have two instances. One's on server 490, the other one's on server uh, uh, 477. And uh, they have an IP tunnel directly through them. The broadcast will go, will go through the service nodes. And you can see there are two service nodes here for high availability. And uh, any of uh, the traffic that's traversing the router is going to go to one of these uh, two gateways uh, also for high availability. Um, Right, yeah, that was the next step. After you create the network and mark it dash dash router uh, external equals true, you need to create a subnet on top of it. And the reason why we didn't have you guys uh, do that step 
is you need to know the IP addresses that map into the infrastructure. That's, so that's something that someone has to do ahead of time. So if you uh, were using a public cloud that's using OpenStack and Neutron, uh, that would be something that would already be created for you. Can you run two L2 agents on the same box? Um, yeah, so in, in the NSX solution, there are no L2 agents. So it's, the, it's, an age, it's kind of the plugin specific thing. So however the plugin decides to implement it. But in the ML2 plugin, there's only one L, L2 agent that runs, because that's the only one that's needed. He handles all the tunnel stuff for you. Oh, share the workload? Um, usually it's really not a lot of work just to uh, like program a few flows. It just runs a couple commands to set up the flows and sets up like tunnels. After it does that, it basically just sits idle. So there wouldn't, um, I don't think there'd be much benefit for us to scale that, scale that out. We could also make it multi-threaded or something like that if we really needed to. So the question was, if you're using NSX and OpenStack together with the hypervisor is ESX or KVM, um, this is multi-hypervisor, so you could be using uh, ESX, KVM, um, uh, Zen, uh, Docker, uh, anything, any hypervisor, more or less, that's, uh, that has like Linux tap support, really. Do I have the URL to the slides? Um, Unfortunately, it doesn't allow me to share it, but I'll go ahead and uh, set, post the link on uh, Twitter uh, after the presentation, so you can find it there if you want. Um, my username is Aaron O'Rosen. Oops, sorry, the mic isn't on. When I select the IP for the internal network, can I select anything to extend my data center network? So when you select the IPs for your internal network, yeah. you can pick any IP address that you want, but it's probably best to use like RFC 1918 space so it doesn't overlap with like public things. So it can be routed. So like for instance, if I created a subnet with 8.8.8.8, .8 then I wouldn't really be able to go to Google's DNS stuff. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. So if I have an internal network, there are no Right, you can pick anything you want. So one of the coolest things is if we have multiple tenants, uh, they could choose to use the same IP address. Uh, and that's one of the nice things that uh, Neutron allows you to do. So like one of the uh, like big use cases is say you have like a physical deployment of a lot of machines. Say you have like a MySQL server that's configured to talk to this other server and everything's already configured with specific IP addresses. You would just suck those images up, uh, push them to the cloud, choose the exact same IP addresses and everything will uh, continuously work. So you don't have to re-IP anything. Uh, what about the floating IP? Uh, the floating IP address is, uh, yeah, that, that would be, because the only reason the floating IPs would be a problem is because it's actually routed space. So technically you could have multiple public networks with the same IP space. Um, and at VMware we actually have a few different public networks. We have one that's a, a colo interconnect that connects into the colo network. Um, and then another network that's a VMware interconnect that connects into the VMware infrastructure. So if you have an instance on the VMware infrastructure that needs to access some VMware specific thing that can't be done from the colo, you'd have to connect to that network. And if you wanted to have a public IP address, you'd connect to the colo network. And in theory, you could have those IP addresses overlapping if you wanted to. So as in the guest is doing tagging? Yes. Um, so right now everything in Neutron is untagged. So like OVS is going to strip all the VLAN tags for you. But what you could do. Um, it's not actually an OVS limitation. That's just uh, like Neutron is just creating networks that are untagged. Um, but one of the things uh, that's there is you can create a private uh, provider network. So say I have some infrastructure that's using VLANs, I can go ahead and create a network that's mapped to a specific VLAN and then create VMs on that. And then the VM will still be sending untagged packets, but then uh, OVS will tag the traffic for you. Right, if you wanted to have an instance on, uh, you would need multiple interfaces in order to access uh, uh, different VLANs.
buying tags as we do change the use cases. What, why do you need different images? No, not, I don't want different images. I want them all to have the same. So, so I want to have them pre-cooked so that I, I don't have to, to rebake them every time I run. Okay. So, uh, Sorry, so w why do you need to rebake them? Like, there's configuration I, that you I need? I, I, basically uh, I mean, why would you need to? Because there's because different. Of configuration. Okay, yeah. so like when you launch an instance, like you can specify the networks that you want to use there. And another uh, possibility is you can leverage uh, uh, Cloud Init or um, Config Drive to basically bootstrap the, the instance yeah, so you could have extra data in it. So they want to control the tagging inside of their instance. So if they if they send traffic up one uh, one interface, it'll use one specific tag. Is that logic built into the application itself? Yeah. Okay. So if it's built into the application, as I was going to say, it could just use like standard like routing, and then it would just automatically happen in the guest for you. Um, but if it's baked into the application, then unfortunately, uh, it's not able to do that today. So where is the load balancer and the health monitor services running? Where is it running? Yeah. Sure. So uh, that's just running on one of the, uh, the beginning here. It's just running on the network node that's uh, running the load balancer for you. So one of the things uh, that um, the open source plugins provide is it allows you to scale things out a little bit. And the way that that works is you could run multiple instances of the load balancer across multiple nodes. And then when you create a pool, it would be mapped to one of the load balancer agents. The same with the L3 agent. So if you create multiple routers, it, if you want to scale out your L3 network, you'd run multiple uh, L3 agents that connect to the public network, and then they'll get scheduled to, to different ones. So it provides you a little bit of a scaling out thing. Is it, and is this like predetermined? I have to make all that decision up front, or can I say now I want to install or run another L3 agent, another L2 agent? Like say you're, like you're running for a while and then you want to expand? Yeah, you yeah. just go ahead and install more and set it up. It'll automatically register, connect to the rabbit bus, and then it'll, it'll show up. Okay, the, okay. But is there a way to see them in the Horizon uh, interface? Um, I'm not sure about in the Horizon interface, but there's a, there's a yeah, the, I don't know if the Horizon interface is, exposes this, um, but as an admin, you can just do a Neutron agent list, and it'll list all the agents that you have running. So one of the things is, is you can uh, actually scale out the DHCP agent as well. So when you do Neutron agent list, it'll show you all the various agents. And you can map networks to various agents, and you can also provide high availability uh, with that sort of. But it, to be honest, it has some problems. <laughs> but okay. in, in theory, okay, uh, thanks. it does kind of work. Is this ice house or uh, what's running right now in this lab is ice house. Hmm. So are you, if you do the curl command, uh, does it no longer respond? Hmm. I don't know. I haven't. It sounds like there could be maybe a, a bug that you're hitting. I haven't experienced uh, this though. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. If you kill Netcat. I think if you kill netcat, there's actually an outer loop. There's a while loop that runs. Because when the request comes in, it eats that netcat thing and terminates. The while loop will sp spawn up another one. So yeah, if you just like re yeah, if you restart the instance, uh, that, would, that would kill it as well. Um. Right, the LVAS agent is going to be, yeah, it's actually the HA proxy uh, instance that's running on the LVAS agent. Um, so when you hit, I hit the load balancer agent with just straight. So you hit the VIP with Telnet. Right, and I didn't give an HTTP compliant syntax. This 
Did you tell them that on port 80? Okay, so this is, so I think this is an implementation detail of, okay, so it might be an implementation detail of HA proxy. Um, I'm not sure like what guarantee, like the API doesn't really make any specific guarantees about behavior, it, it should, but like each vendor decides to implement things differently. Um, but it's possible that there's a way to do that and we're not passing something to H, uh, HA proxy or there's probably a way to do it. Uh, yeah, it would be HA proxy that's running in this. Yeah, so ESX and KVM can coexist together, and we actually have ESX and KVM uh, running in the cloud. So some of your instances are on ESX, some could be on KVM. Um, can this be implemented without any Can they coexist just ESX and KVM together? Um, today you would need NSX for that. Um, you could, actually you could do this, well, in the next release of Juno we're looking to integrate uh, Virtual Center with Neutron directly so you could create networks in VC. And so you could create a network in VC that's mapped to a VLAN and then also have that VLAN span to KVM host as well. So like here you can see we have 39 uh, ES, ESX, ESXi nodes and 149 Ubuntu servers running KVM. Cool, thanks. Cool. I think we can keep this active for a, a while. Um, I'll have to ask uh, Eric and see when, um, how long this is going to be active. But one of the things that we're planning on doing is if you want to do this lab at any time later, um, I think we'll put an, e uh, an email address or some contact info on that URL, and you should be able just to email that, and someone will give you a request code, and we'll go ahead and spin up the lab for you and like let it run for a week or so, and then it'll automatically tear down. But I think we can leave these running for a while. I don't think we need to delete them. Is there like a developer version of NSX or could you get your hands dirty, like on a private install of it? Um, I believe that there's a, uh, if you go to, there's a, a VMware training lab site that I think you can take a lab that allows you to play with NSX. Um, yeah, th there's. You want to see the slides? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll post them later. I need to upload it to Dropbox or something like that. Uh. Cool, thank you very much.